All right, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you with us in Schaumburg, hope you've enjoyed the show. All of the presentations in this room are also part of the NNP Symposium, which is an online educational conference we've been running since 2020. Um, this year, we have partnered with Central States for the first hybrid event that we've done where we have the in-person component as well as viewers online. Uh, so we are being live streamed through this lovely camera um, and our speaker for this presentation is remote. So we will have Matthew Tahori up on the lovely projector. Uh, Matthew, you are welcome to go ahead and turn on your camera and unmute. Um, for the viewers online, welcome back. Um, as always, you will be able to participate in the Q&A at the end. Um, we will be alternating between questions from you guys and from the audience here in Schaumburg. So I believe that's all I have. And we've got Matthew back. OK, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, and we will be hearing about the Sponsian double arius, which I hope I said correctly. <laughs> Take it away. Oh, you are still unmuted. Or you are muted, excuse me. <laughs> should be there we go. There I'm we go. sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me and hello everyone. Fortunately, I couldn't uh, be there in person in Schaumburg. But thank you all for attending my presentation and let's get started. So we have the sponsoring double aureus here. Let's see if my computer wants to comply. There we go. So the sponsoring double aureus is a gold coin in the Hunterian coin cabinet in the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And this coin might look familiar to you because in around Thanksgiving 2022, a bunch of news articles started coming out out of England. Oh, whoops, let me go. Here we go. They are proclaiming that this coin, which was thought to be a counterfeit for hundreds of years, is actually genuine and confirms the existence of a third century usurper in the Roman province of Dacia, modern day Romania. And the particular individual who proclaimed this is Professor Paul Pearson of University College of London in London, England. And I said, I jumped ahead a little bit here. So let's go ahead and go back just one slide about a little bit about me. So my name is Matthew Tavori. I am a history student at Florida Atlantic University. Go Owls, you might know us for going on that wild uh, final four run in college basketball. <laughs> uh, I'm a former Numismatic Guarantee Corporation grader and quality control finalizer. And I currently work as a world coin dealer specializing in revolutionary siege and shipwreck coins. I've been featuring the New York Times and NPR, and I am an Apmex approved wholesale dealer. But getting back to the coin here. So the Sponsian double aureus for hundreds of years has been called a counterfeit, with specifically the first instance in 1867 with Henry Cohen calling it poor, uh, I have to go see my notes here, poorly made and ridiculously imaged modern fake, Rudolf Munsterberger in 1923 calling it, it appears to be made cast from molds as is common in historical fakes, and Alexander Borsha in 1998 calling it a 18th century counterfeit. However, Professor uh, Paul Pearson of the University College of London argues that all these individuals are wrong and the sponsoring double aureus is actually genuine. So let's go get into the history here. The third century crisis was a time of uh, trouble. Oh, whoops, sorry. Uh-oh, technology doesn't want to play well. It was a time of trouble in the Roman Empire from 235 to 275 AD. It saw 24 individuals claim the imperial throne and multiple parts of the empire break away. During this period, civil war and barbarian invasions were a common occurrence. And the average reign of a Roman emperor would be about two and a half years with some reigning only months. And you can see here, we have two maps here on the bottom right, we have encircled in red here, is where Dacia is, modern day Romania or Transylvania. And on the left, we have the different maps uh, or the different states that the Roman Empire broke up to at the ascension of Aurelian in 270 AD. We see we have in Gaul and Spain and Britannia, the Gallic Empire broke away. So purple is what remained of the Roman Empire and the green to the right there 
is what the Palmyrene Empire under Odonathus and Zenobia took over. And you'll notice here Dacia abandoned in 271. Um, the province was abandoned by Aurelian because it was a easy access point for barbarians invading the Roman Empire. See the Goths being in the 250s evaded. You had multiple battles in the area south of Dacia and Moesia. Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica was sacked in 254 AD. And all those invasions came through Dacia. And Dacia was not unique in it. It allegedly had a usurper go ahead and base his rebellion out of there. In the nearby province of Moesia and Pannonia, which is right over here, we had two rebellions uh, that were, began in 257 and in roughly 261. The first one was led by Egenis, and who was swiftly defeated by Regalianus, but his troops then proclaimed him Imperator, and he was eventually defeated uh, by legions loyal to the Emperor Gallienus in 261. And the rebellion of Regalianus in particular was put down by the two legions based in uh, Dacia the 5th Macedonica, and the 13th Germania. And to the right here, you see a epitaph from the 13th Germania that was dedicated to the Emperor uh, Gallienus, who was the legitimate emperor in Rome at the time. And that is actually in a museum in Bucharest, uh, Romania at the moment. And to the left, we see two coins from the rebellion of Regalianus. Um, do note the style of these coins. See at the bottom here, it is Regalianus himself, and the top is his wife. You notice they're struck over um, under uh, uh, other Roman denarii. And I believe they are struck over probably Trajan Decius denarii or Gallienus denarii, one of the two. And they're, uh, they're very crude. The, you see they're double struck at the bottom one with the crown on Regalianus. And then we have the alleged rebellion. So Sponsian alleges that, or I'm sorry, uh, Professor Pearson alleges that Sponsian was a, a usurper-led rebellion against the Emperor Gallienus in Dacia and the 260s. However, we have to know exactly who was the Roman military commander in Dacia during the 260s. It was Flavius Aper, who was an accomplished military general who would go on to be the Praetorian prefect to the Emperor Carus in, from 282 to 284, and the father-in-law of the Emperor Numerian in 284. And Flavius Aper influenced those two emperors, Carus and Numerian, to go invade the Parthian Empire, which is, we'll go right over here at the edge of the map, this little green over there. And unfortunately, the invasion failed. And it, it was alleged that Carus was struck by lightning, killed by the gods, but he no one knows for sure, but he died during the invasion. So Numerian took over control of the army, became emperor, and Flavius Aper's daughter was married to him, and he became Numerian's Praetorian prefect. And on the retreat back, Numerian caught a eye infection and was when went to his litter to recover. And while he was in his litter, orders were being given, commanded by him through Flavius Aper. And Flavius Aper would continue giving orders in the name of the Emperor Numerian until the stench from the litter was too much to bear. You see in the bottom left here, the soldiers threw open the tent, uh, the, the cloak, and they discovered the Emperor Numerian died of an eye infection, allegedly. Um, I've seen it in sources where it was alleged that Numerian was assassinated with a knife in the eye. But it's no one, there's no real consensus with that. So then the army went ahead and was up to the army to go proclaim a new emperor. Flavius Aper was one of the candidates, and a cavalry general named Diocles was the other candidate. And you see in the middle there, they're both on the mountain uh, in front of the armies. And Diocletian proclaimed that he knew for a fact that Numerian had killed the, or I'm sorry, that Flavius Aper had killed the emperor Numerian. And he then proceeded to swear on Sol Invictus which was a precursor monothe uh, monothe uh, monolithic uh, god, or mon I can't pronounce, sorry, 
a, a proto single god to our modern Christianity and then stabbed Flavius Aper and proclaimed himself emperor. And after Flavius Aper's death, Diocletian and all of his colleagues in the Tetrarchy damned Flavius Aper's uh, memory, blamed him for the death of Numerian, and banished all or downplayed all of his achievements. So we know Flavius Aper was the commander of Dacia during the 260s when Sponsi allegedly rebelled it would be in Diocletian's best interest to go ahead and blame Flavius Aper for a rebellion in Dacia during the 260s. However, he is not blamed by Diocletian for that. And there's no mention of a rebellion in Dacia during the 260s at all, actually. And the one other source of usurpers during the reign of Gallienus, actually, is called the Historia Augusta. The Historia Augusta is notoriously inaccurate, and lies about history. It has a list in it called the 30 Tyrants, and it alleges that there was 30 individuals who rebelled against the Emperor Gallienus during his reign. Now, this number is made up. The exact number is, I want to say, right around 10. The number is inflated to 30, though, because they wanted to go ahead and make it seem like Gallienus was bad and they wanted to go ahead and match the 30 tyrants of Athens, which was a Spartan oligarchy that was put in charge of Athens following the Peloponnesian War. And I'm just trying to get my notes here to the 30 tyrants, you have to forgive me. So in the 30 tyrants, there are tons of fake usurpers. There's one like Trebellianus, who was allegedly based off a real usurper, Regalion. And then we have the usurper Celsus, who was a allegedly a military tribune proclaimed proconsul in the legions in um, Cyrenica. And then we have Saturnus, who was allegedly a dissatisfied governor in North Africa, who was killed by his legions for being cruel. Though he is based off a different usurper named Julius Saturnus that rebelled in the 280s against the emperor Probus. But the Historia Augusta isn't making up all these names. Yet, despite all these names made up, there's not one name that is similar to Sponsian or anyone allegedly rebelling in the province of Dacia, which that is the lowest bar. And if it doesn't clear their lowest bar, which is notorious for making people up, that's a good sign of there was no rebellion in Dacia and there was no individual named Sponsian who led that rebellion. But what evidence is there that there was anyone named Sponsi? Well, in 1713, a hoard of ancient coins was discovered in Roman trans in Hungarian Habsburg, Transylvania, and it includes six double aureuses featuring the bust of Sponsi. Now, I use the term double aureus throughout this paper, and it's the title of the presentation. Um, it should be noted that term is not technically accurate. It's disputed if these were actually coins or medallions. Uh, for simplicity, I am going to call this a coin, though it is up for debate if anything larger than an aureus was a medallion. But along with these six double aureuses, the coins contain, or the hoard contained coins from Alexander the Great, the Roman Republic, and Roman Empire provincial, provincial issues. And which is quite um, fascinating and impossible because the oldest coin would be an Alexander III tetradram in there from the three from as early as 323 BC to probably 180 BC, anywhere in that range, to co coins from the 260s AD. And it's those coins would not have been circulating at the same time. If anyone knows what Gresham's law is, bad money drives out good money. Well, during the third century crisis, the Roman Empire began debasing their coins, beginning with the Emperor uh, Domitian prior, and they really got going with the Emperor Septimius Severus. And all the good coins that were of pure silver and gold were comp hoarded, melted down, recast into lower quality, clipped. So any of these coins circulating at the same time would be impossible. And but specifically with the Sponsi double aureus and this specific example to the bottom left here, it was acquired by the by Carl Gustav Her, uh, Herres, the inspector of metals for the Imperial uh, coin collection in Vienna, 
and the Hapser court, uh, court, uh, the court chamber advisor, Johann David von Palm. Um, these coins were placed in the Habsburg coin cabinet, and it was alleged in Rudolf Munzenberger's notes that they may have been put in the cabinet with the help of a Viennese antique dealer. However, he could only find it mentioned in passing uh, from the notes of Johann David von Palm. And we see here at the bottom right all the different types of coins allegedly discovered in the 1713 Transylvania hoard. There was also allegedly discovered a silver coin of Sponsian. However, it is believed that coin was either lost in history or, or lost in history or accidentally destroyed in Allied bombings during World War II. Not entirely sure. But if you notice in the bottom right here, a lot of those coins look a little bit funky. We have a type B, uh, B type three Gordian the third aureus and type four Philip the first or second aureus as well. And you are not wrong, wrong to suspect that is weird. The coins discovered in quotations there in the 1713 hoard contain many coins that are either suspect authenticity at best or confirmed counterfeit at worst. And in his research, Paul Pearson uses five examples from the 1713 hoard, all, or all in the Hunterian coin cabinet at the University of Glasgow. Um, by Paul Pearson's own admission in his research article, these coins were featured different iconography legends than normal issues. And in fact, the Gordian III Aureus was struck using the die of a silver Antoninus. I just wanna dwell on that for a sec. A gold Aureus, which is the highest denomination, one of the highest denominations the Roman made, has its own die, would not have been struck with a silver Antoninus. And even the die of the silver Antoninus is incorrect. The obverse, if it was the real dive of Silver Antoninus, would read Imperator Gordianus Pius Felis Avigate. Um, I forget what the AVG stands for. And the reverse has more standing rather than advancing on with the billowing cape as a normal Silver Antoninus of Gordian III would be. And the reverse should read Martum Prop uh, the Gettorium, which this does not. And you can see the coin is very crudely uh, struck in crude style with blundered legends. And the bungling gives the impression that the engraver was illiterate. And that's from Paul Pearson's own words. And in addition, a final extraneous letter may have been added to balance the composition, according to Professor Pearson. It, it, to anyone that knows Roman numismatics, that is so blasphemous. None of that is correct at all. This is a walking contradiction compared to his words. Nothing in this coin is correct. And it's not the only coin in the hoard that's incorrect. The alleged Philip the first um, aureus, and it's straight from Paul Pearson's uh, research article. The obverse legend appears to refer to Philip the first, albeit misspelt with an extra G at the end. It should probably read Philip as Pius V although this would be a unique legend to this emperor. The obverse features the head of a female wearing a winged helmet. We interpret it as the head of Roma copied from a Roman denarius of the first century BC with the curious legend squeezed to the left and right as an afterthought. We note that apart from the legend, it would be appropriate for the Sponsian reverse. The reverse is based on the principate design except for the figure facing right, spear up points upward, and the legend is seemingly meaningless jumble of letters, including what appears to be a K, which would be expect exceptionally rare in Latin script. This is another one that, this point just a walking contradiction. The, Philip I would have no, no Roman emperor would have the reason to go ahead and copy the design of a Roman Republic denarius, especially for a gold coin, and this copy of the design is not even the, the correct copy of the design from the, Rome, from the Roman Republic denarius from the first century BC. The legend is just random assortments of letters. And they're not of any of them, of the right font as well. The iconography is wrong. And the fact that uh, Professor Pearson acknowledges that 
it has an extra G, but even if without that extra G, it would be unique for this emperor to have that legend is just amazes me as a, his, a student of history and someone who's in academia that someone is just so blind to all these obvious red flags when it comes to these coins. And the reverse as well is has an extra K and he, K it very rarely appears in Latin script. And the fact that Pearson just say, and it appears to be an extra K and it's exceptionally rare. He doesn't think maybe that could be incorrect. Bongles the mind. And we get to the sponsoring double aureus itself. The sponsoring double aureus is not immune to these same problems. The obverse features a head wearing a radiant crown with the ledger imp sponsiani. Um, the Sponsi Double Aureus legend is of strange spot, silent spelling, much like the other two counterfeits uh, allegedly found in the Horde. The obvious ledger, Imp Sponsiani, is grammatically incorrect for a formal title that would appear on a coin during the third century crisis. Imp Sponsiani is the dative form of a title that would appear on the coin. It should read Imp um, Sponsianus with a U that would look like a V and an S at the end. But the um, nominative form that it is written in that only appeared later in the 1500s when Latin be um, became um, when the gramma the grammar of Latin started to change and there's two forms of Latin right dated and nominative and the sponsi double aureus it just uses the wrong form for something that's from the 260s AD for the type of writing and the reverse of the Sponsine Double Aureus is actually copied from a C. Min, uh, Minicius or Gurina Stenarius, minted circa 135 BC. I do apologize about my pronunciation. <laughs> um, this implies that Spontian was fighting for the restoration of the Roman Republic. A general or a senator minting a coin with the design of the Roman Republic while finding Mark Antony and Octavian towards the end of the civil wars from 43 BC to 27 BC would make sense. However, a usurper declaring himself as emperor would have no reason to use an iconography of the Roman Republic. By the time the third century crisis was happening, the Roman Republic had been abolished for 275 years. Um, if we go back to the point from known confirmed usurpers like Regalianus, we see here he has the reverse of Sol Invictus for his patron deity. And he has, he's wearing the radiant crown. These are not using designs from the Roman Republic. And it's just out of place for that to be allegedly found in mint in the 260s AD. But the name Sponsi in itself is just highly unusual. Sponsian is the English translation of Sponsianus. In Roman history, there's only evidence, I use evidence in quotations here, of only one individual named Sponsian, who was allegedly the chamberlain to the Augusta, Livia, the first empress of Rome, wife of Augustus. However, the supposed authenticity of this Sponsian is suspect as best, as the only evidence that uh, Livia's chamberlain named Sponsian, or was named Sponsian, is an inscription from a funerary urn copied in a book published in 1727. And this inscription reads, Nicomedes me, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that, but notice the inscription uses the same misspelling of Sponsian. That was instead of Sponsianus, which is the modern data form it's of Latin instead of the correct form. And it's interesting, this, the funerary urn was discovered in quotations there in 1727, only a few years after the 1713 horde. It does make you wonder, the only two pieces of evidence supposedly discovered at the same time, both using the incorrect spelling. It does make one uh, wonder. Now, what is Paul Pearson's argument for alleging the Sponsian double aureus is genuine? The core of Pearson's argument is the sponsor double aureus is generally based off tests such as visual light microscope, ultraviolet mic imaging, scanning electron microsco uh, microscopy, reflection mode Fourier, and transform infrared spectroscopy. And they prove that the coins from the third century 
crisis because these tests shows the where and the Durham's constant double aureus is old. And we all know that's a bunch of you know what, but it does kind of make sense that Professor Pearson would be um, doing this because Professor Pearson is not a professor of history, mind you. He is a member of the Earth Science Department at the University uh, College in London. In fact, his specialty is weather. So it kind of does make sense he's using these different weather uh, tests to go ahead on a coin. But his argument is very problematic as it assumes any wear on a coin is genuine. We all know in numismatics, there's a long history of individuals called coin doctors who artificially wear, repair, and alter coins to enhance their appearance. Coin doctors are not a new occurrence with one named Carl Wilhelm Becker, who was active in the early 1800s, being one of the most notorious counterfeiter of coins, making them appear genuine through wear. And we have here a bomb left an image of him and all these coins are counterfeits minted by Carl Wilhelm Becker. And in fact, actually his counterfeits are sometimes worth more than the real coins. We see here to the top right, I forget which alleged fake usurper this was to the top right, but this was struck over a genuine um, denarius, I wanna say of uh, Antoninus Pius. I believe the alleged usurper was some, uh, from the 150s AD. And we see here in the middle, a counterfeit Maximinian um, double uh, denarii. And I do forget who is that on the bottom right, that gold aureus, but that is also a, I do believe that is, I want to say um, Caracalla at the bottom, but I could be wrong. But all those are counterfeits. And we see he's able to very convincingly make some genuine, decent counterfeits. And just assuming the dirt on a coin is old, it's a couple hundred years old, that it is a couple thousand years old is incorrect. We know the coin's been around since at least 1713. My theory is someone, when I put the dirt on in 1713 to make it more believable. <laughs> um, and even this dirt, a circulating double aureus, a wear on a coin of such a high denomination is highly unusual. The aureus was a high value coin worth roughly 833 denarii during the third century crisis. For uh, reference, the average uh, manual labor on a farm would make 25 denarii a day. And so the value of the aureus meant that only the vast majority of the, po the, vast majority of the population did not use the coin in economic transactions. Being that the Sponsian coin is a double aureus, only the wealthiest of Romans would have used this denomination. The purpose of the double aureus was for convenience when conducting high uh, value transactions. These transactions did not see the double aureus spent as a common coin, but traded on a ledger from one owner to another while never leaving the security of the imperial treasury or the temple vaults. And due to this lack of circulation, there is a high concentration of aureus and double aureuses in uncirculated condition from this time period. We see here we have a double aureus of the Emperor Aurelian and a double aureus of the Emperor Gordian III. You see, they have nowhere whatsoever. They are uncirculated, and that's how most of these are. And in fact, I should go back to one more thing. The individuals using the double aureus would have been senators, generals. Their positions and wealth would have been based on loyalty to the emperor in Rome. Owning a double aureus of a usurper is a good way to go ahead and be accused of treason, which is a very common occurrence throughout the Roman Empire. The way Roman emperors would raise money is, I accuse you of treason, regardless if it's true or not, and they would seize your wealth to finance the imperial coffers. If you had a double aureus from a usurper, it's very fairly easy to say you've been accused of treason and the coin would have been seized and melted down into a different coin for the imperial treasury. But is the Sponsian double aureus genuine? Now, the likes made by Henry Cohen, Rudolf Lunzeberg, and Alexander Borussia that the Sponsian double aureus is counterfeit, and statements such as modern coins laughably concede, very poorly executed, it appears to be made from cast molds as a common historical fakes, and an 18th century counterfeit are correct. This coin is a ridiculous counterfeit that any individual with basic knowledge on Roman coinage should be able to recognize. And why did Professor Pearson try to go ahead and 
claim that this coin is genuine. My personal belief is Professor Pearson, who this is not his first instance of going and doing history from the third century crisis. Despite the fact he is not a historian, he is a member of the Earth Science Department at the University of College in London. He has written two books before on the third century crisis. First, Maximinus Thrax, From Common Soldier to, Roman em to Emperor of Rome and the Roman Empire in Crisis 248 to 260 when the gods abandoned Rome. And these books have received their fair claim of uh, fair share of criticism for their historical accuracy, according to different historians, such as um, Pavel uh, Flavian Chilkos, uh, emphasized that the English author often mixes secondary sources lit that are literature and bibliography and its um, primary sources such as ancient authors, archaeology, and epigraphs. That's a basic historical thing that any historian should get right. And you have Kasaba Sabo, who is a, um, who is a uh, fellow at the University of Seged in Roman history, and who says in his 2016 volume, uh, volume on page 30, his, he lists the legion camps of Ulpia Traina in the third century correctly, but or uh, incorrectly, I'm sorry. And it's actually Colonia Sarmas, because I'm not even bother pronouncing that. Um, but this is not only a mistake, he says, but it's a falsification of history. It is similarly a big mistake for Professor Pearson to confuse the Pharyngian cap with the Dacian cap, um, which in, in Roman iconography is usually separable and not completely identical. And in fact, Professor Pearson's book are published by Pen and Sword Military Publishing House a publishing house that has also received its fair share of criticism from Cassaba Sabo. The 2016 volume was published in Pen and Sword Military Publishing House, just like the latest book, which presents a period between 240 and 260 AD. Needless to say, this is not one of the publishers known in Roman and professional circles of Roman research. Although many well-documented military historians and educational volumes have been published there, they have also published rarely recognized ancient historians such as Michael Sage and Ilka Sivane. And when peer reviewed, these books have been ridiculed uh, for being highly inaccurate. And this research, I believe, is, ties into that. His latest book, I believe Professor Pearson stumbled upon the name Sponsing and its alleged rebellion, heard about the coins, and decided to go out and make his try to make his name by saying this coin is genuine and everyone else is wrong. And even despite his own writings that the coin has all these incorrections, it has a blundered legend, it has the incorrect legend, it has a K, which is rare in Latin, it's copying a design of a coin 200 years ago. He still thinks that the, the Sponsor Double Aureus is genuine and confirms the existence of a usurper. And it's just mind boggling to a student of history that someone could put on the blinders and ignore all of the all the evidence so needs to say this coin is a very laughable counterfeit so that is my presentation i'd like to thank all these following individual organizations for helping me with this research zachary tate of atmex ben wallace of numismatic guarantee corporation cassaba sabo postdoctoral research fellow at the university of Saged. Stanley Chu and Christopher Bullfinch of Stax Bowers, Boston, Kyle Johnson of Heritage Auctions, Dallas, Professor Lawrence Korshnak, author of Siege Coins of the World, Ben McCare, CEO of Wandy Numismatics, Dean Kinzer, CEO of Kinzer Numismatics, Professor Eric Hanna of Florida Atlantic University, and the Newman Numismatic Portal at the Washington St. Louis. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say also this presentation was based on an academic paper written for Florida Atlantic University, and it's currently pend uh, pending publication in a couple different um, academic journals. If you would like to read the full paper, which goes into much more depth, it is available on my link tree. Just type in linktree.com slash WCSFL. You will be able to access the paper and read it, and it's all three, uh, 33 pages of its uh, glory there. <laughs> So thank you all very much. And we are finished here. Liana, are you there? Yes, now I'm back. <laughs> there we all go. Right. 
Okay, then we will open it up for the Q and A. Um, if you are watching online, just click that Q and A button at the bottom of your screen and send in questions. I will be reading them off anonymously, so no need to worry about that. Um, otherwise, for anyone in the room, do we have any questions, Matthew? I am going to have you stop your screen share. I forgot to oh, do that sure. a second. It's the red button at the top of your screen. There we go. So Got it. There we go. It is still going. You have turned off your camera instead. Oh, my screen share. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? You said screen share. There we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> screen sorted over here. All righty. Um, then a hand did go up over here. Forget who it was. There we go. Uh, oh, Matthew, uh, this Sponsian story really took off in the public media when it came out a few months ago. Uh, any idea of you know, why it got so much traction? Um, because I would say it's probably more a question about journalistic ethics and standards. Um, no, it makes it sounds really good story. Ooh, Roman, long lost Roman emperor discovered. I think that was actually a couple of news titles. And it said, oh, we got this professor at this university and college saying it's real. Let's not go ahead and do our due diligence. Let's go and just take them at its word. And they absolutely ran with it. And for I would say for about maybe a good week, Professor Pearson managed to convince several different universities, including the University of Glasgow in uh, Scotland, that the sponsoring double ORIS was genuine. In fact, the coin was on display as recently as February with a whole display about how sponsoring was real. And then the academics started telling people, no, this is not genuine. Words started coming out. And the coin was quietly put back in the coin cabinet. In fact, actually, I was planning on going to go visit the coin in Glasgow until they went ahead and put it back in the coin cabinet. Um, it's, I just think it's, a, I mean, it sounds a sensationalist story and it goes ahead and makes a story for them. Journalistic ethics, I'd say, is probably the best answer. <laughs> All right, we do have a question over Zoom. Uh, do you know the first emperor to have double aureus is struck? Um, so that would be, I would believe actually it'd be Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, though again, a double aureus is kind of just a generic term or an inaccurate term, really. We're not entirely sure if these coins were really meant as medallions. And you'll see if you look at like major auction houses such as Kunker or Heritage or Stacks, you'll see they have medallic me uh, medal of four aurea where we're not, we think it's a metal, but if it was a coin, it would be this specific much. I think those are more medallions. The double aureus or coins or medallions of that size, I would classify personally as a coin. That's how I do it in the paper. Um, but it could be either or, and there's still debate about this. And I don't think we'll ever get a definitive answer on this. Okay, we have one in the room. Um, can they tell uh, when a coin was melted by spectrograph or when it was actually from the first spec? I understand that there's a way of taking a very small sample of the coin and putting it through a spectrograph to say when that when the gold was actually melted. Um, so there is a, a spectrograph does do something similar. It doesn't actually tell you the exact date of when it was made. It can actually tell you specifically where it's from. And so in Paul Pearson's um, test, it shows the gold came from Transylvania, Dacia region, and said the gold coin could be minted anywhere from, I think, 200 years ago to 3,000 years ago. It doesn't give you an exact science. It's like when you go see dinosaur bones, they say this dinosaur existed from 50,000 to 40,000 BC. It, you can't get any more specific. And it's theoretically, it's in the time period of 260 uh, AD. Uh, even though the coin was really minted in 1713 AD. Okay, so there's a big variance, just like um, all of the uh, carbon dating and everything. Else. Yes, exactly. It's the exact same thing as carbon dating. You can get a date range, but when you're trying to get down to specifics, good luck. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's nothing else on Zoom, so we have one in the room. Yeah, yeah. I know all the coins from the third century this time period and the, the different usurpers are struck. And when I read the articles, the things coming out on this and just looking at it, my background is chemistry and casting gold, you know, I've done that. It's like, it's a little boat, it's a cast. 
Yes. That takes more time if you're doing it with the wax casting, but if they're doing it like the uh, bronze uh, tetrarchy, Diocletian, the, the cast forgery, I, I actually haven't seen the real coins. Frank Cole actually hasn't even seen them. I've seen all the little clay molds, but um, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would they cast? You know, you you would you would have a die and you would strike them. You could do a lot more. Than you you, you are you are correct, sir. Um, the coin is not struck; it is actually casted. I do go that in the academic paper a lot more depth um, about the whole die characteristics and everything. Um, I believe it was specifically casted by Padawan metal counterfeiters. So, beginning the 1600s and 1700s, there um, the, during the Italian Renaissance, a later Italian Renaissance, um, Padawan metals became. Are being passed off as genuine. So my honest opinion on this, this specific coin, the Sponge Devil Aureus, it is made by someone who was familiar with Padawan metals and was casted by them. And I actually specifically was casted as a um, scam because the coin is, I want to say at the time, it was, I want to say 10 to 12 grams roughly of gold. That's not an insignificant at the time amount of gold. Who could afford that? Well, it was sold to the Habsburgs and put in their imperial coin cabinet. I believe it was originally casted to be sold to the Habsburgs as a scam and make a lot of money. And they fell for it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> when I first saw that, I thought, this is a joke. Iconography is off, the, 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 the details of the fabric of it's off. And it's like, it looks like something like, I tell them on the floor that this show is not like this program. And the other points came along with exposing uh, the other ones that fill up or board in. It looked like there's something from a board game. <laughs> yes. Ex essentially, yes, you are correct. It's, and the fact that Professor Pearson acknowledges that these are, do not match any known Roman coin, are copying designs hundreds of years old, using incorrect legends, it, it as a historian, it just, I sit here and I go, so you gotta have the blinders on really strong just to intentionally ignore all of this. I mean, the extra K, I'm unfamiliar of any ancient Roman coin that has a K on it, uh, or it has a unique letter to Roman emperor, or it copies a design 300 years later. Like, in the Roman empire, there's like the emperor um, Titus, restruck some coins of the Emperor Claudius. That was 40 years after the fact. And he used the exact same dies. He didn't go and create a new die using the design flipped inverse. I, I just chalk it up to, he was going headstrong wanting to prove that this coin was genuine over anything else and make a name for himself. I think the real story is today, in our world today, Oh, there's so much fake news. Fake, you know, I couldn't believe that it got real publicity. It was even in Coin World. I know some of the news national media. It was on uh, uh, the newsletter from uh, Germany or whatever, yeah. the, uh, the weekly, Coin Weekly or whatever. It was on Thursday. And they had something on it. And I'm going, this is crazy. You know, this is, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I, I experimented in many, many stuff. And I think I got some better tokens than things I do. Pass better than that. You, know? <laughs> terrible. you, you are correct. It, does, it is a problem with journalistic standards. I actually did speak to a reporter from NPR that I know about this, and I approached them like, hey, would you guys potentially be willing to do a story about how this coin's utter rubbish and how everyone's an idiot, essentially? Uh, not to say that per se, how everyone's running with this incorrect story. We'll put it that way. And she did bring to her credit, she did bring it to her editor, but I never heard back from them. I assume they just decided no, it's they didn't have an interest, or they I guess it's a journalistic standards question. But even then, this is not like it's an iffy maybe thing and maybe real and maybe fake. This has been known to be a counterfeit since 1867. And the first instance was in Henry Cohen's book. I got my notes here. Um 
where, where the heck? Well, yeah, I don't remember the title. But in 1867, Henry Cohen called it a fake. And same thing with 1923 and Rudolf Munsterberger. In fact, actually, in my research, I was able to find a note from an individual who attended one of Mr. Munsterberger's academic talks about the coin in Vienna. And then 1998, um, Alexander Brusha did a research on this coin and came to the same conclusion. They all came to the conclusion it was a counterfeit. Now, if it was a counterfeit made intentionally to scan the Habsburgs or as a paddle and metal that was made to as a theoretical thing that someone then passed off as genuine, they disagreed. But everyone agreed it was a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we have nothing else on Zoom. So if you are online, go ahead and send in any questions you have. Otherwise, anyone else in the room? Nope, no other questions. Okay, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. And if anything comes in in the meantime, we'll get to that at the end. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, all of these talks are being recorded. They'll be uploaded to the NNP about two weeks from today. If you are registered for the symposium, which everyone watching online should be, you will get an email when those go up. Um, if you are here in person and would like to get an email when those are available, we invite you to register for the symposium. It is entirely free and takes about two minutes. Uh, the sign up here, as well as the one out in the hallway, um, both have a QR code as well as the URL to register. Um, there will also be an announcement on the symposium website, as well as our social media when those recordings are available. So that's it for this one. Uh, thank you, Matthew, so much for taking the time out. Thank, to thank you for having me. And if anyone, again, would like to go ahead and read the full 33-page academic paper, it is available if you go to uh, www.linktree.com slash WCSFL. And you'll just it's the double sponsoring aureus, a historical hoax is the title. And you'll be able to read it there. And I do appreciate everyone tuning in. Thank you very much. All righty. We will be back at 2.30 Central, 3.30 Eastern, or Lord knows what time zone you're in, um, with Winston Zach speaking on counterfeit flowing hair half dollars. So more counterfeits for you this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, theme going. All right, thank you very much, everyone.